Hello, hello. I'm Hannah and this is Sweet Fern Homestead. And today we are talking about what to plant five weeks out from your last frost date. One of the biggest mistakes that a new gardener will make, I made it, is starting all of your seeds really prematurely. And the reason that this can become a problem is that the plant will start to stress if it is started too early and can't get into the ground when it needs to. So things like cucumbers and squash and beans, those things we tend to hold off on. So you've noticed if you've watched any of these videos, we haven't talked about any of those foods. Now is the time when I am starting to direct sow a lot of things. I could have probably started a couple of weeks ago, but what happens here is we get an incredible amount of rain and we are in a wetland. And so our ground stays wet, sometimes it floods. And so I'm just very considerate about that. I don't want my seeds sitting in water. I'm just being patient. So what I recently did is I planted some cauliflower in a salad container. You can watch that video if you're interested at all, uh, instead of starting it inside because my broccoli and kale have done so well outside that I just decided to go for it. I didn't think to plant cauliflower or maybe I didn't want to plant cauliflower, I'm not sure, when I was doing the winter sowing, but you can still do that. You can certainly start cauliflower seeds indoors now as well. Another thing you can keep sowing in that four to six week range and throughout the season, like you can succession plant these if you want, uh, are your dark greens, your Swiss chard, your kale, I really like perpetual spinach. I've talked about that before, but I'll talk about it again. My Swiss chard got eaten, devoured by bugs, but the perpetual spinach was left alone. And this is actually a shard. So um, I'm really excited to kind of pay more attention to that this time around. Now let's talk about beets. So beets, you can start inside and you can direct sow them. It really depends on what your conditions are. If you're worried about your little, the first leaves of your beet plants coming up, being eaten, then I would say go ahead and start these inside. One thing that you can do with beets that is a space saver and makes things so much easier in transplanting is you can sow three beet seeds in one module. And then when you go to transplant that, you're gonna take that module, put it in the ground, and you're gonna let those three beets grow together. They'll form together and they'll sort of push as they're coming up the other one a little bit gently apart. And so you'll have a grouping of three really beautiful beets. I find that usually you get one smaller and two bigger. I like to harvest tender beets, so that is not a problem for me. So that is a really good trick if you wanna get some beets started and you don't want anything to be eating those tender leaves that first come up. Beets are a wonderful multi-purpose plant. There have been years when I have had no bulb on the beet, but I have harvested tons of greens. Some people don't like the beet itself and they prefer to just eat the greens. So you can plant beets in succession all year long. I have found that over time, planting roots gets easier and easier. In the beginning, it was very difficult for me. We're not gonna talk about carrots today, but even beets were really tough for me to grow. And I just had to keep going, keep trying. Planting them three, even if I direct sow, I'll put three seeds right next to each other. This has just worked beautifully. Another thing I'm gonna be starting is kohlrabi. And I'm not gonna be direct sowing this because I did not have good luck with that last year. I'm going to sow these in modules, but I'm going to probably um, 
do that outside. So there will be some things that I'll have outside. I can pull in at night if I need to, but for the most part, what I'm trying to do is get a really well-established plant in a module that I can then plant out and know where it is and take care of it. I just found that these were very erratic for me when I direct sowed them. So I'm gonna try that this year and see how that goes. I love kohlrabi. If you haven't tried it, you can find kohlrabi at most farmer's markets. It is so delicious, just eaten as is. I usually take um, the skin off and uh, just chunk it up. You can use it, you know, just munch it like you do a carrot or a cucumber. You can also grate this into coleslaw and salads. And I cook with it, I, I stir fry it. It is just such a versatile, delicious vegetable. You'll see them purple and you'll see them kind of a whitish green. Radishes, I am going to be direct sowing. I've already started to do that. I plant my radishes in between my garlic. So garlic goes in in the fall, and then in the late winter, early spring, it will start to come up. So my garlic is about this big, and you give it a considerable amount of space in between the rows, you can plant your radishes in spring. So that garden bed is now serving double duty. I have a bunch of different ones. This was a free one from uh, Baker Creek. It's Japanese wasabi. This is a 60 day. I have China Jade, also a 60 day. China Rose. China Rose is 30, so that's great. You want a, you want a couple of them that are just gonna kind of get going for you. And I have an Easter egg blend as well, that's 28 days, so you'll get a variety. You'll get the purple, you'll get the white, you'll get the pink. There might be some breakfast radish in there. What I have already sown is breakfast radish. It's the radishes that are somewhat oblong, they're red and white, and you can slice these radishes. Okay, slice them. Fry them in a little bit of butter, if you can eat butter. I can't, so I'll use coconut oil or olive oil and salt and pepper. If you want, you could squeeze a little lemon in there, but you don't have to. And then get a beautiful piece of toast or some bread that you love, or maybe something you've made. Put some butter on it. If you can eat butter, I can't, so I use olive oil. And then put your radish slices, your warm radish slices on top of that toast and serve it with some scrambled eggs and I guarantee you will be hooked on radishes. You will you will be so excited for radish season in the spring and also in the fall. And then I have some daikon and the daikon takes, um, you know, it's like those bigger ones. They just take a while. I think the China Jade is a, is a daikon. So you want to, you want to anticipate that there's a possibility that these will bolt, which means that the weather gets too warm and they will start to flower. Now, I don't mind this because the flowers are incredible for pollinators and they are delicious to eat. So I won't be planting a lot of any of the larger 60 day variety radishes right now, but I'm gonna plant a few because you never know. You just don't know if it's gonna work or not. But what I will be doing is on the other end of my growing season, I'll be counting backwards from when that first frost is gonna come and I'll know that I need about 60 days, I'll give myself probably 70, to grow these larger daikon radishes. These are the radishes that will go in the kimchi. So I can also plan to have a, a cabbage growing at that same time in the fall. However, if I grow my cabbage in the spring, it lasts, all you do is put it in the fridge and it lasts for a really long time. So I don't mind these things not you know, hooking up perfectly. You don't have to put daikon radish in your kimchi. Uh, I just like to if I have some. Now I harvested my daikons in the fall. I still have them in my fridge in a Ziploc baggie and they are perfect. So I'm kind of hoping I can hook it up with either cabbage from the farmer's market or cabbage from my garden. So radishes, if you find a 28 day variety, you will have radishes within a month of planting them. I have never done anything other than direct sow these and um, I'm not sure why you would need to. 
So one seed, kind of like every inch, if you're worried about germination, do two seeds and then you can um, thin them if you want, or you can let them grow kind of like the beets do, where they just grow together and they kind of push each other aside. When I do the radish planting, I, I do try to be a bit careful just because I don't really love thinning anything. So I do try to just get like one every inch. And then if I need to go back and, and thin, you can, but I find that one inch spacing works great. All right, it's time to talk about peas. A lot of people where I live in New England, Zone 6A, will plant their peas right around St. Patrick's Day. I mentioned we've had wet weather, so I kind of held off. About two weeks ago, whenever the chip drop came, uh, as that whole thing was playing out, I ran over and planted peas. Now. Remember I talked about my garden boxes with the garlic and now the radishes. Well, now they are actually going to grow peas as well. So I did this last year and it was fantastic. So I had the garlic, I had the radish, and then in the back row where the fence is, I planted my peas. I planted sugar snap peas last year and this year I'm gonna plant all, I planted shelling peas along that fence because they are harder to harvest. It's harder to reach them. So I want these to grow. I'll probably be doing a harvest very similar time and just taking the whole lot of them off and then shelling them and then preserving them. The sugar snap peas, I'm gonna plant over one of the arched trellises, the cattle panels in the garden. Now, I don't love cattle panels, but they work. So I'm looking at ways that I can make them look nicer. But of course, once you have your, your vines growing on them, they do look beautiful. So I'll be planting snow peas. Let me see if I can get you a, a okay, so these are 70 days. I'm gonna be planting sugar snap. And, and the reason that this is a really good idea to do these right now is because we're starting to be in the 40s at night. There's gonna be some high 30s, but mostly we're in the 40s. And we could absolutely have a frost and peas can handle that. I don't see, I don't see the days on this, but we'll just assume it's similar, like a 70 day sugar snap. Now, I grew both of these last year. And you see the tendrils on those? So this one is Magnolia Blossom Tendril and this one is Sugar Magnolia Tendril. I remember saying to myself, the green ones are better. They're sweeter, they're more tender. The purple ones you had to be really careful about when you grabbed them. I didn't really actually eat many of the tendrils. I just let them be beautiful. The, the pollinators loved these. They grow beautiful flowers. If you want kind of a combination of like a sweet pea flower, which is not edible, it's poisonous, and peas that you can eat if you, especially if you have kids around, be careful with what you plant because they're gonna start just munching on things. This is a really good idea. So you'll get these gorgeous flowers. They're just beautiful. And then these tendrils that grow. It's just a romantic, romantic, plant. This is really beautiful. You could put this in a cottage garden on a trellis and then you would be able to eat off of it and uh, have that beauty. I'm really big on foods. I love beautiful foods that you can eat. I will plant that over a flower any day. It's potato time. It's potato time. Whether you're planting in bags, pots, or the ground, it's potato time. And this is a potato that has been chitting. And chitting means you allow these eyes to start sprouting. So this has been sitting on a bowl on my table. I have sprouted potatoes everywhere. Our harvest began to sprout probably a month ago and I salvaged what I could. We ate off of them and then the rest I'm just gonna let become seed potatoes. Now I have some options here with this. Because there are so many eyes, what I could do is I could cut this right here and I could take this top and just let it kind of seal over for a couple days before planting and then I could take the bottom and that would give me two seed potatoes. But it doesn't really matter. You can just plop this whole thing down. I'm gonna be using grow bags. I will make a video on that. I have a bunch of potato videos. Uh, it is so easy. Growing potatoes 
is one of the easiest things I have ever done. Now, of course, this will have so much to do with like your weather and if you get like a, a potato beetle. I was picking potato beetles off every morning with my cup of coffee. Um, we didn't get infested with them, but there were enough that I needed to pay attention and do that. They're pretty easy to spot actually. Um, the grow bags are great because if you need to move them, you can. My potatoes did wonderfully in the grow bags. The other bonus is that if you do not want to bring these in to store them, once the leaves die back on the potato, you can just pick up that grow bag, you could put it in your garage, you could put it undercover somewhere, and those potatoes will just be stored in the dirt. It's pretty fabulous. So I'm planting a lot of potatoes. A lot of potatoes. And uh, I'm just so excited to, to try it and see how everything works. This is an organic potato from the store. My smaller potatoes that I have that I grew last year did come as seed potatoes, which means there's no risk of them carrying any disease. So when I plant this potato, I do know that this is something that could carry some sort of disease. These are growing in, going in grow bags, so they won't be bothering my earth, my garden, my soil. So if something goes wrong, I will know about it and I'll be able to take care of it in that bag. Now is potato time. I am a big believer that we should be able to grow our food from our food. So like when you get, um, a lot of people are familiar with Rancho Gordo beans, dried beans are a very popular bean company. Well, guess what? Those are seeds. Your beans are seeds, right? So you can take a handful of those beans that you love and you can plant them. You can plant, um, you know, just look in your spice drawer. What do you have in your spice drawer? Do you have coriander seeds? That's That grows cilantro. It's just, you know, it's amazing to think how far removed we've gotten from our food. Our food grows our food. So for the first time, I decided to save some lettuce seeds and I let my one, just one lettuce go up and flower, bolt, go to flower, that when that happens, your plant becomes very bitter and you're not gonna wanna eat that lettuce. I have tried, I have tried, I have tried. It is no good. So it flowers, and then those flowers go to seed, and then you can collect those. So I just kind of clipped that branch, put it in a Ziploc baggie, and I've saved that all winter long. And now I have a Ziploc baggie filled with hundreds from one plant hundreds of lettuce seeds. So I'm growing my food from my food. When a radish goes up and flowers, it makes these beautiful seed pods. They're edible, you can eat them, you can ferment them. We like them on tacos. And what what is fabulous about that is that, I mean, one radish creates hundreds of seeds. So if you think about food security in that way, where we're growing our food from our food, like it's right there at your fingertips. Those seeds are right there. And it does sometimes feel a bit daunting to do that to begin seed saving. But if you take it a step back and you say, okay, I'm, I'm not ready to seed save, but where can I find seeds that are already available? Where can I get them from my food? Sweet potato, potato, dried beans from the store, dried peas from the store, right? Well, I have grown to look forward to these videos. I love to just talk about seeds, to talk about plants. And if you enjoyed, if you would do me the sweetest favor of hitting that like button, if you're new here, please consider subscribing. And as always, I'm sending love to your hearts. Thank you for being here, I appreciate you.